Hello again and welcome back to our last day of daily Bible study for this week. We're going to continue through John chapter 7. We're going to pick up today on uh, starting in verse 19. But before we do so, let's pray. Uh, loving God, sometimes we like to paint positive pictures of ourselves or, or more positive pictures of ourselves than, than our actual attitudes and actions warrant. And Lord, we like to cover things up and we don't like to say the things that we are thinking out loud. And yet, Lord, uh, so oftentimes we are transparent and we're certainly transparent to you. Lord, help us to see ourselves well enough that we can uh, repent when we need to repent and that we can follow you when we need to follow you. Lord, help us uh, surround us with a community of people who will up, up build us uh, rather than help to blind us to what's going on. Lord, we ask you to be with us during this time, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are picking up again today uh, in chapter 7 of John, which has this long arc of Jesus going to the, uh, to the Jerusalem area, uh, to celebrate in the Feast of Booths and to also uh, preach in the temple. And so uh, Jesus already stood up and he's talked about the fact that, um, that uh, his teaching is not mine, it belongs uh, to, to God who sent him. Now, of course, now we theologically would want to say as Christians that, in fact, that means it's also his uh, because you can't separate Jesus from God. But in any case, this is where we're going to pick up this next paragraph here where um, in verse, verse 19 where Jesus says, "'Did not Moses give you the law?' And yet none of you carries out the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did, I, I did one deed, and you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know where this man is from. But whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me, whom you do not know. Or is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man yet laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, When the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? So this is, this is I mean, again, there's always so much good stuff going on here when, you, when you're looking at it carefully. And um, there are several things to, to acknowledge here. And one of them is the fact that Jesus talks about, um, he said, want to listen to Moses. Um, so why are you trying to kill me? And the immediate response is, well, what, what are you, what, you get, are you demon-possessed? You know, are you crazy? You know, no one's trying to kill you. And then immediately we have, you know, the people are saying, hey, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? You know, and, and they talk about how they're trying to seize him and all the rest. And so it's one of those things where, you know, I can imagine just from people, you know, knowing people today and, and all the rest that nobody wants to say out loud that they want to kill this guy. And yet that doesn't change the fact that they really do want him dead. They want him out of there. They don't want him bothering them anymore. And they can say they don't want to kill him all day long, but the fact of the matter is the crowd knows that they have set themselves up against this man, you know, and, um, and, and in fact are shocked and amazed that they're not acting consistently with their hatred of Jesus because they're just listening to him. They're not doing anything about it. And I think that's really a significant thing because um, we have a tendency to not want to say negative things about ourselves. We don't want to acknowledge negative feelings, negative attitudes, negative actions, negative whatever. And so we have a tendency to not say things out loud. Um, you know, one of the things that is an issue in our world today is the question of racism. And nobody wants to say of themselves that, they're, that they are a racist, and yet we all agree that racism, to one degree or another, is still kind of around. But nobody wants to say it about themselves, you know? And um, so that's one of those things, I think, where there's this, this huge temptation to say, uh, to, to want to portray ourselves in the positive light. But what's the difference between one person who's not acknowledging, you know, and not naming themselves for what they are, in this case, hatred of Jesus, and, um, but yet actually does hate Jesus, and somebody um, who uh, thinks they don't hate Jesus, but in fact does? Or, or rather, so how, how does somebody who doesn't actually hate Jesus call themselves as someone who doesn't hate Jesus, and someone else says they don't hate Jesus, but they really do, at some point the words have a disconnect, and, and that's significant. So, so I, I want to draw attention to the fact that these people are trying to deny the fact that they want him dead, and yet the crowd says, isn't this the person that they want dead? Um, it's also significant here that um, you know, they say that we, you know, we know where this man is from, but when Christ comes, we won't know where he's from. 
And um, I don't know exactly where that comes from because that's not a reference to the Old Testament. But, you know, so they, they know of him as someone who's from Galilee, who's from the, the city of Nazareth. But that's not really where he's from, is it? Because he was born in Bethlehem, and he was then raised for a small time in Egypt and then left to Nazareth. And so he's culturally Nazarene. He probably has a Nazareth accent, and yet, um, you know, they don't actually know where he's from because what they assume about him is not actually where he's from. And he certainly, they don't understand the fact that he has come from the Father. Um, But at the same time, I think it's also interesting that we notice that this crowd is also realizing that something is happening with this man, Jesus, that, that he is doing something that is unusual, that even if they have been resistant to it, um, they realize something is going on. Because they say, if this guy is not the Messiah, if this guy is not the Christ, um, you know, then do we have to believe that someone's going to come along and do even more things than him? Which is a fascinating argument to make, because later on we're going to hear Jesus tell his disciples that they will actually do more things than, than these, than what he was doing. Um, but the people start to realize that if Jesus isn't the Messiah, he's still incredibly significant and probably worth listening to. And also, the interesting thing is, um, you know, they're starting to realize, there's, there was a saying, was it, um, you know, the rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? They start to suspect that, um, that uh, e- even when people are saying they're against Jesus, that maybe there's some recognition that they actually have some idea of who he is. Um, so I guess that's the question that, that I want to raise for your own consideration today is, um, you know, has there ever been a point where you've realized that you've been fooling yourself, <laughs> you know, where you've t- had a story you've told about yourself, you know, certain things about yourself, th- certain things you're for, certain things you're against, and then realize one day that actually the story you're telling yourself about yourself is not actually as true as you thought it was? I think that's a really interesting question to raise and to think about. Um, but also to raise the question, you know, what was it that finally convinced you? Uh, that Jesus was who he says he was. Was it miracles? Was it something else? Did, did God speak to your heart? You know, how is it that you came to understand who God was? Because I think that oftentimes we are so caught up in our personal, individual experiences of God that we forget uh, and, we, and we think about how God might reach other people as if it's totally disconnected from how God reached us. And, um, and I think it would be worth raising that question of if God were to reach somebody else like God reached you or God reached me, what might that look like? And if we approach things the way we've seen God actually work instead of trying to manufacture a way that we think God should work, uh, would that make a difference to how we do ministry, both as individuals and as a church? Well, that's all I have for today, and that's the end of this week's Bible study. We'll pick up again next week, uh, continuing through the Gospel according to John chapter 7. Have a good day.